So we help me welcome Henry Groover. <laughs> Thank you, Sam. <laughs> Well, now that we heard about my life, I think we better talk to the Lord for a minute and get my heart straightened out so we can talk. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, we thank you. We thank you for the opportunity to share the message of heaven. We thank you for the thought of heaven, how great a comfort it brings to us again and again. I can't thank you enough, Father, for Jesus. And that he made heaven possible for me and for whosoever will. So, Father, we ask that in this time of sharing about your home, the place of your abode, your dwelling place, that you would enable us to express with accuracy that which you have allowed me to experience. And that at no time that I would receive the honor or the glory for it. For without you, there would be no heaven. So, Father, we ask that your will would be accomplished in this session. That this subject would be made clear and plain to each person that hears. And, Father, I am fully persuaded that that can only happen if you speak through me, if I have the liberty that comes from heaven, if I'm enabled by your strength, by your accuracy, by heaven's call, to express a little bit of a window of understanding about the realm that we seem to know so little about. We need your help. I need your help. Each one hearing needs your help. I ask that you will anoint the listener and the one that sees this on their television. I ask that you will anoint each one and anoint my heart and my spirit that I may speak forth as of the ability that you give and again, as I've asked before, but once again, that in everything you might be lifted up and glorified. We ask this in the name above all other names, the name of Jesus Christ, our Savior and our Lord. Amen. Since we're talking on uh, heaven, on the Prophecy Club production, I think it's important that we talk a little bit about what does prophecy have to do with heaven. And uh, in my travels in the last month and a half, I've been seeking the mind of the Lord regarding this particular moment right now. And I've been asking for wisdom. I've been asking the Father to give me something that I could begin as sort of a heading of this. I realize that the title of it is Six Hours in Heaven, and by the end of this you will very well understand what we mean by Six Hours in Heaven. But I wanted it, I felt in my heart it should be kept in the context of, of what does prophecy have to do with heaven? And so therefore, this particular topic was laid on my heart. And I hope to uh, make reference to this again and again in this presentation. And it's this expression. All true prophecy begins in heaven. Did you hear what I said? And I underline in my notes the word T-R-U-E. All true prophecy begins in heaven. And it's very important to understand that what prophecy that is birthed or brought forth from heaven will always have the earmarks of heaven. It will bear out the nature of heaven. Now that could be 
given to you from many different aspects or many different directions. So I want to give to you a little bit of scripture here in beginning to help you to understand the combination of what all can really come from heaven so that you understand that, and we will get into this in the latter part of this recording, but that there are things that come from heaven that you wouldn't expect because you've got to realize the creator and the judge of the entire universe has his throne in heaven. So I want to begin with Romans chapter 1. It talks about prophecy in Romans 1. And in verse 8, it's very explicit and very clear. And I'll quote that to you. For the wrath of God is revealed from heaven. Hmm. From heaven? The wrath of God? Yes. The wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all. How much is all? It's not a part of, some of, or a few, or a little bit. It means all, against all ungodliness. And that word ungodliness means, in the Greek, ungodlikeness. Which means that God has determined that you and I should take on the nature of His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And the only way that we can come into that realm is to be born of the Spirit, which is commonly known in the Christian circles as born again. And the reason we use that term is because Jesus used that with Nicodemus, didn't he? He said, you must be born again. All right, so the wrath of God is revealed from heaven against all ungodliness and unrighteousness of men who hold the truth who hold the truth in unrighteousness. Now that cuts across the doctrinal lines of many of our doctrines, and it cuts into the deep of many of our doctrinal teachings, where we teach liberalism. And we teach that it's all right to sin because God forgives. I realize and I agree that it, we will sin, but I want us to get something uh, really corrected in our heart, our mind, and our spirit. It is not all right to sin. It grieves the heart of the Father. And anything that grieves the heart of the Father will ultimately affect you and your relationship with Him and His relationship with you. And. Tonight, we're, or in this segment, we're going to be talking about building a relationship with the Father. We must build a relationship with the Father. And by the end of this segment, you are going to understand a whole lot more about the importance of that relationship with the Father. And I believe that it is going to be more precious to you to understand the understanding that you're going to receive from this. So let's read a few other scriptures. I have said that if you are a student of prophecy, or you're not, but you want to know the plan of the ages, God's plan of the ages, written out in three consecutive chapters, I could ask you, is there anybody here that knows what three chapters those would be consecutively? Well, let's just turn and uh, go to Revelation chapter 19. They give you the consummation of the plan of the ages. And this 19 is like a, the, the consummation of God's judgment with the wicked and the introduction of God's dealings and righteousness with the righteous. The fulfillment of both. In other words, the cup comes up full of iniquity, but also the cup of righteousness comes full. So it's important to consider this. All right, let's go. Verse 1. Let's see this prophecy that is coming from heaven and see if it earmarks heaven, if it has the traits of heaven in it. Revelation 19, verse 1, And I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, Hallelujah, salvation and glory and honor and power unto the Lord our God. Huh? That's the atmosphere of prophecy? 
I thought prophecy only came in the presence of a solemn assembly. Let's read on. Look at verse 2. Here comes prophecy. The fulfillment of prophecy in the previous chapters. The great whore is judged. The harlot that controlled the earth is judged while in heaven there is great rejoicing and praise and honoring and glorifying the Lord, the harlot, the great whore, is judged. Verse 4, we have another scene. The twenty and four elders are falling down before the throne and worshiping. So sandwiched in between one and two is this expression of praise worship and adoration. And yet the fulfillment is taking place down on the earth. Now look at verse 5. Another praise gathering takes place. And there are those that are praising him, both great and small, while the fulfillment of the plan of the ages is taking place. Many of the materials that are offered to you on the Prophecy Club tell you about these events and how they are being fulfilled. Some people have difficulty over these materials, but I would say to you the explanation I always give is to think about it this way. Jesus said that we are to be wise as serpents, but harmless as doves. What does it mean to be wise as a serpent? but harmless as a dove. It means you are fully aware and alert of all of his tactics, right? And another expression that he gives. He gives a warning that that day does not take you unaware. So awareness of the signs of the times is a vital part of you and I walking in victory. It is of utmost importance to the Lord that that day does not take us unaware. So therefore, the only way to be educated to this is to allow yourself to be exposed to the understanding of these events. Now, if you say, no, it's too violent, then you realize how much of the Bible has violence in it? Do you realize how much violence there is when God says it is enough? Whew. Samuel told Saul, utterly slay all. Everything that moves and breathes. Men, women, and children, and animals. Why? because the entire part of creation in that area was defiled, was totally defiled. On the way to uh, this recording today, I was informed. I don't scan the Internet. I had no idea of this. But I was informed that you can literally come across in scanning all manner of sexual expositions, even human beings with animals. And I said, no, I don't believe this. How could we allow such a thing in America? It tore my heart out to hear that, and it still troubles my spirit to think that teenagers, children can get on, and I've, my little children, my little grandchildren at three years old, I can't do what they do, but somehow they get that computer going. They put a game in there, and they can drive a race car on the computer. They can play games. I don't know how to turn the thing on or turn it off. What would it be like if at their age, you know the next step is to get on the Internet and you don't put a blocker on that Internet and they get into that. And then you wonder why your child is having all of these problems. Look what he's exposed to. Do you see what I'm saying? The danger of it. The danger of it. Now, let me ask you a question. Do you believe that this is pleasing to God? Do you believe that a nation that not more than a decade ago a man landed on this soil from over in India, he was called the disciple of bleeding feet. Every year he would walk over the Himalayas, I think it is in India, uh, the Andes, the Himalayas. 
and down into Nepal, or Tibet, rather, sorry, Tibet. And he would preach the gospel and would be tortured. And the Lord would send his angels to rescue him, and he'd go back over. He was coming to America. He was excited about it. And as he got off the plane in New York to go through customs, he came through customs and, and someone was to meet him. He was going by a newsstand and he saw all these pictures of magazines on the newsstand. And he turned around and he tried to get back on the airplane. And he said, no, I'm not in America. I'm, I, I'm, I'm going to the Christian nation. I'm going to the nation. They all worship Jesus. I'm in the wrong country. What an indictment against us. He couldn't stay here the full time he was supposed to come and minister because he said everywhere he turned, there was too much evil. Oh, what an indictment. Well, we must get on. I won't leave you in heaviness. We'll end dancing from the rafters, so to speak, not literally. But I believe that you will be lifted up and encouraged. But let's read on here, verse 6. After this great praise gathering of verse 5, verse 6, a voice thunders, exalting God. Verse 7, the plan of the ages that if you love the Lord Jesus Christ, this is your hope. This is your hope that maketh unashamed. We'll talk about this tonight when I talk about getting up in heaven and walking on the streets of gold. We will really cover some detail about this verse, verse 7. For the marriage supper of the Lamb is come. Oh, I want to talk to you and tell you about the preparation for this event in heaven. Then how about verse 11? Here comes the Lord riding on a white horse his vesture dipped in blood. His name is called the Word of God. Verse 12, there's a description of him as a mighty warrior. Verse 16, the Lord of Lords and the King of Kings is his name. Verse 17, a great angel making a decree to round up all of creation for the great day of God's judgment. Whoa. Do you mean to tell me in that one chapter there is literally the identification of all of that kind of fulfillment? Yes, it's right there in chapter 19, and a whole lot more is in that chapter. But the reason that I have given this to you is to help you to understand the earmark of heaven that all prophecy begins, all true prophecy begins in heaven. Now, obviously, at the January time of the year, when you go through a, any kind of a store, here's all the tabloids. What are they always reading? So-and-so's predictions for 1998. You see what I mean? And they're psychics. They're all kinds of people that are giving their predictions. Well, here's the prediction. The Word of God is so clear if somebody's hungry to learn about prophecy, tell them to start in Revelation chapter 1 because it says it is the revelation of Jesus Christ. And it says in there, blessed is he who readeth. Readeth. It doesn't say you're blessed because you understand, but it says you're blessed because you read. Just read these prophecies and you'll be blessed. And then it doesn't take long until you get into some heavy things that is difficult for you to understand. But then just jump back there to chapter 18 and the judgment of God on the world government system. The beast and his making everybody, try to make everybody take their, uh, the number. And the judgment of God on them because they worship their merchandise, starting with jewels and gold and silver, down to the last thing on the list after wood and, and hay and stubble, slaves and the souls of men. The last thing of value of this world system is slaves and the souls of men. I'm not telling you something that isn't in here. You can read it in Revelation 18. So if you have a tendency to say prophecy is all gloom and doom, yes, I assure you, except for the Lord Jesus Christ, it is gloom and doom. 
but it is the judgment of God on the wicked that's gloom and doom. You need to understand that from the perspective of Psalms 2 and Psalms 37. All right, let's go ahead and move forward. I want to begin telling you some of the areas that God began to prepare my heart for heaven. You know, there's got to be a preparation to go to heaven. You, you would not be comfortable in heaven if you did not have some preparation. The, one of the uh, men the, that I just made reference to, Sadhu Sundar Singh, called the, the disciple of bleeding feet in India, had this vision, and I, I've never forgotten it. I've really appreciated it. He saw the death of a philosopher, the death of a drunkard, and the death of a child. And he said, the philosopher, he said, the, the angels of the Lord came and bore the child away when the child died, and the child went to heaven. The drunkard went to hell. He did not know Jesus. He had not been born again. The philosopher had said in the vision to the missionary when he tried to witness to him, I will take my chances. You tell me that this God is a God of love. If he is truly a God of love, then he wouldn't send anybody to hell. So I won't repent. I don't need to go through this ritual of born again, so forget it. And then he died. As he died, he was plunging down into the abyss, and he screamed out. And uh, Sadhu said in his ears he could hear the, the ringing of his voice as he screamed out and said, I knew there's no God of love, for if there was a God of love, I wouldn't be going to this awful place. When all of a sudden a voice spoke from the heavens above, and two angels came down like lightning and caught him and brought him up, as the voice said, bring him up here. And he was set in front of these beautiful gates. And the gates opened. And Sadhu said, I was inside, and I looked at him as the gates opened, and I saw his face. As all of a sudden his face lit up, and this look of expression on his face, see, I told you I wouldn't need to repent, as he ran into the gates of heaven. But the moment he got inside, he began to crouch down, covering his eyes and looking around and, and trying to say, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. Where's the gates? Let me out of here. I'm not ready for this holy place. It's too pure. I can't stand it. And he made his way, stumbling, and ran out the gates and plunged off into hell, screaming, I'm unclean. I'm unclean. I'm not ready for this holy place. That taught me something very valuable. Many people say to me, if God is a God of love, then why would he create such a horrible place as hell? I say to you, the word of God says it was never made for anyone in mankind. It was made for the devil and his angels. But if you take sides with him, then you have chosen his allotment. Well, then... Does God send people to hell? No. They couldn't stand heaven, just as that man. If he allowed them to come into heaven, they would want to leave just as that philosopher did, and they would flee from the holy presence of God because their uncleanness would not be comfortable in the presence of pureness and holiness. And that's what we want to get into and talk about and help you to understand about heaven. But first, I want to begin by testifying to you the first experience that I had going into the heavens. And as uh, Stan gave the introduction regarding the man that he knew that was caught up into the third heaven or fourth heaven. I forget which one it was. Now, fourth heaven. All right, there are many levels of heaven. Do you realize that uh, uh, descriptive-wise, heaven begins six inches above your head? <laughs> All right. So there are heavens, right? And in Corinthians, it speaks of the different levels of heavens, of the celestial, the terrestrial, and all of these realms. So I want to talk to you more of the area in my first trip to heaven about the celestial heaven. And I believe that is the realm in which we see the planets, the sun, the moon, and the stars, the planets, and uh, the solar systems out there that we can't identify yet. Some of them we call the area of the Milky Way, of which they believe there could be hundreds of thousands of solar systems in the Milky Way. So in that experience, I had to die to have it. <laughs> 
And it wasn't a pleasant experience. I, I have to tell it to you this way. My wife killed me. <laughs> I could ask you for a show of hands, but I won't. When I go, went to Japan the first time and was speaking before a, a large group of people uh, across from the Emperor's Palace in Tokyo, I said, how many men here have a wife that killed them? And the interpreter shot off the interpretation. Why, I thought I was going to lose half the congregation right there, or half the group of people. They looked at me with such shock. I says, wait a minute, wait a minute. <laughs> Let me explain that. <laughs> Lest you think that in America we are totally violent people. <laughs> it was in an, in an automobile accident. And uh, she didn't mean to. She loves me too much. But uh, she was a vital part of getting me back to life again, too, okay? It's one thing to have a wife that can kill you. It's another thing to have one that can believe God to resurrect you, all right? <laughs> we were in a van, my wife and I, and eight of our children. And I won't give all the details. I don't have time. I have many materials I want to get into, so I'll just scan quickly across the situation of the accident. But except to say that that night I had been driving all night long, our eldest daughter had given to me for Father's Day a tape by the Gaithers called Fully Alive. And uh, this will help you to date it back in 1984, I think is how long ago this happened. Yes, 1984, Father's Day. Isn't it wonderful to go to heaven on Father's Day? God does all things in order, you know. <laughs> I was on my way to see the Father on Father's Day. Well, I had driven all night and was getting that just dawning time when it is so difficult to stay awake and so I pulled off the highway up in the mountains of Northern California, the big mountains, and said, honey, uh, my head is dropping and uh, I don't want to go off a cliff. If you will just simply uh, drive for an hour, I'll be refreshed and uh, I'll be able to go on for four or five more hours and you can have some more sleep because she had worked for a straight 24 hours getting eight children ready and uh, her and I to go down to Phoenix, Arizona from Portland, Oregon for a wedding, our second daughter's wedding. Well, she took the wheel and I crawled in the seat behind her, which was a full seat. The front was a full seat. Our 10-year-old was at her right hand up front and she was driving. She had the headphones on. She wasn't buckled in. She has always hated seat buckles and thinks it's an infringement upon her rights of free moral agency and choice. Uh, <laughs> we won't get into that anyhow. That's my wife's politics. We'll stay away from it. But it wasn't a law yet that you had to be seat belted uh, in Oregon at that time. We understood later it was in California. But uh, none of us were buckled in. Obviously, how do you buckle up when you're laying across the, st the, the seat sleeping? So I wasn't buckled in. It'd be very uncomfortable trying to strap yourself in. But I wouldn't have been planning this anyhow. None of you would have planned what I went through. <laughs> You just don't make plans for those things. They happen. But um, I got into the deepest sleep because I was sleeping so good. Right behind me was three of our, our boys. And then in the very back of this 1970 Volkswagen, laying on blankets and pillows, were four of our youngest children. And uh, all of a sudden, I was awakened with her crying, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. Now, we always do that anytime there's an emergency or any sudden fear. She had just flown from Portland back not long ago, just before we went to England, and uh, they hit into some turbulence. She had been going quite long hours with the grandchildren and visiting and was tired. And so she was asleep on the plane as it hit some turbulence. She was awakened by the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus coming out of her own lips. She heard the sound of her own voice in her ears. And in her sound sleep, she was saying the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And she shook herself awake and looked at the man sitting in the seat beside her. And he was kind of giving her the strangest looks. <laughs> and, <laughs> and she said she just kind of smiled at him and he kind of grinned at her. And she said, I thought, well, I think I better go back to sleep. And <laughs> so this is how heavily programmed this is in my wife and, and me. Uh, any emergency, the slightest thought of a deer coming in the road, a bird or, or any animal or any person looking like they're going to come out in front of me, the blood of Jesus is the first thing I think. Why? 
Why? Ephesians chapter 2. You're a far ways off from heaven, aren't you? But you're drawn nigh that quick through the blood of Jesus. We're drawn to the throne through the blood of Jesus. And if you want your petitions known instantly, it's through the blood. So she was crying, the blood of Jesus, the blood of Jesus. And something was banging under the van. And I couldn't figure what it was. And I was trying to get out of this sound sleep. And I made myself sit up trying to get my eyes open. And... Uh, She's always said, well, honey, if you'd have just stayed laying down and praying, you wouldn't have got killed. <laughs> and I says, well, dear, what man on the face of the earth would stay laying down when his wife is crying loudly the blood of Jesus and something is banging under the van real hard? I had to get up, and the van is leaning dangerously. Well, she'd gone off all four tires off the road trying to get the headphone wires that were plugged into the dash that our 10-year-old had got his feet tangled up into the emergency brake and the gear shift. So she was over here trying to untangle them. And my wife, when she does something, it doesn't matter if she's picking something up or what, she automatically does this. Well, what does that do? That takes you off the road. I tell her, when you do that, if the road is straight, rest your elbow on the side of the, the armrest so you know you're still, you know, basically going that way and you're going straight and then reach over and get it and you're still on the road in the right lane. But it's all right. <laughs> My children, after she did some spins on black ice one night and jumped this big ditch and landed in the middle of a cornfield in Nebraska. <laughs> Now, believe me, I'm not running my wife down. If she is here, she'd be laughing harder than you because she knows what I'm saying is the truth, and it's not critical. It's just explanatory, all right? <laughs> but they jumped this big ditch, which a travel home shortly before uh, had went down into and, and literally blew all tires on the thing, and they had to tow it out with a big wrecker. She jumped this ditch and landed in the middle of the cornfield, and the car was still running. She looked around, and she says, Well, get out and see if there's any flat tires. David got out and went around, come back and sit in and said, well, no, Mom, there's no flat tires. So she said, well, let's head for that farmhouse. That's the only lights I see. We can't go back through this big ditch. So she drove across the cornfield and come in the backyard by the barn of the farmer <laughs> who had just finished with his big tractor putting it in the barn and was coming out of the barn from pulling the big travel home out so that the, the wrecker could haul the travel home away. <laughs> and she said... He, he gave her the funniest look when she came by the barn. So she stopped, and he said, "What? Are, there's no roads back there. What are you doing back there? Well, I just hit some ice out on the highway and spun and jumped. Not that ditch. Yes. You jumped that ditch? Do you know how wide it is? Well, anyhow, as they finally get out on the highway, and she is going about 10 mile an hour over this same area again, mind you, because she's going to make sure she doesn't do this again. She overhears David in the back saying to the others, comforting them. David is 14 at that point. He was 10 when this, this accident I'm going to talk about in a minute occurred. He says to the others, he says, Well, you know, it's all right, I guess, to have a mom that doesn't know how to drive <laughs> as long as she knows how to pray. <laughs> so... I think that describes my wife the best. She does not claim to be an expert driver, but she does know about prayer. So she was crying the blood of Jesus, and I set up when all of a sudden a chunk of that asphalt that was breaking off where she was trying to get the tire back up on the pavement, it didn't give. And when that happened, the rubber of that tire, that tire turned like this, spinning the wheel, throwing her over against David. We were already leaning, and it put the van around like that, throwing her over against David on the other side of the van, and we went careening across the highway on two wheels. Well, there's a big, there was a big black question mark about this long on that highway afterwards that I saw, and I think the question mark meant, do you really want to do this? Because when she grabbed the steering wheel and pulled to get behind the wheel, it took the rubber of that tire that was leaning like this going along and forced it into the asphalt, causing the van to do a complete endo. It did a complete flip around and came upside down on its top. And we skidded exactly right straight down the white line. 
leaving orange and white paint on both sides. Well, that was the situation, but above my head was the car top carrier loaded with all the luggage of 10 people for 10 days, for a wedding, for play clothes for the children, for casual clothes for mom and dad, and some things for the couple that's getting married, our daughter. When you take the force of a van and you bring it all down on top of that, something's got to give. Yes, the luggage gave and all the suitcases got crushed and strewn 300 feet, about 260 feet down the highway, but the roof gave too. Well, I had just sit up and wouldn't you know it was above me and I'm the tallest one of the family at this point. And so the roof comes down on me and from the hole in the roof and the blood where my head had a hole in it, the pieces that come through from the car top carrier, nailing me into that van, pressing me into the seat, I only felt pain briefly. There's a song that I so appreciate. It's an old one you may remember. It only hurts for a little while. <laughs> that's what they tell me. That's what they say. I am a testimony of that. And I say this to really be an encouragement to some of you that have or may someday lose a loved one in a terrible accident where their bodies are brutalized. When your body is injured to the maze your mind was, you leave your body that fast. It doesn't even hurt a little while. It's gone. I didn't feel the pain from my head to my toes more than three times, and it moved quickly, but what I left my body. As I left my body, I could hear the van going on. It was like I was left behind. The van was going on. I can still hear the crunching of that metal, the, the terrible, loud, grinding sound of, of the car top carrying all that under the van, and it's, it's just grinding up and spewing out from under the thing as the top is grinding away. The front windshield blew out. The back hatch blew open. The four children in the back should have been slung out of that thing like a catapult. Yet the witnesses said they still laid upside down on their pillows and blankets. Their blankets didn't even fall down toward the roof. Now, they were upside down. The back hatch was all the way open, scraping the highway. Not one of them fell down. Not one of our children fell down in the seat. The 15-year-old directly behind me said, I looked at you, Dad, and you were pushing like this, and then you kind of relaxed. I looked out the window, and I thought, those aren't clouds going by. That's the white line, for we had begun to skid toward the other side of the road. And she said, I realized, we're upside down, and I'm not even buckled in, and I'm not falling. And she said, I looked down because I thought I felt like a buckle around me holding me in. And there was no buckle but, but holding me. I looked at my two brothers on the left, and neither one of them were falling down. I looked then in the back, remembering the four little ones in the back. And there they were, except for Mark, the oldest of the four. He had hold of the, 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 the back of the seat like this and was looking with pretty good-sized eyes, he said. <laughs> but the other three were still laying on their pillows asleep, upside down and not falling. Mark should have fallen right on the roof. He didn't even fall on the roof. Well, when I left my body, I could hear the sound of that metal crunching and all, and the last thing I heard was the cry of my wife as I heard one final crunch. It was when the, the van turned slowly going to the other side of the highway and hit a big boulder on the other side of the highway, and it flipped that van in the air so violently that all the witnesses said they just knew it was going to go down the grade and disintegrate. Instead, they said, it's like it flipped up only enough to bring it on upright where the wheels were coming down, and then it came down like a feather in slow motion and landed on all four wheels and didn't even roll down the grade. I didn't know that. The last thing I heard was, oh, Lord, we're going over. Well, in my mind, what do you mean your mind? You were dead, Henry. Yes. Let me tell you something about death. When you die and you leave your body, you have more of a body than you do in your body. 
Now, that may be hard for you to believe, but I want to tell you something. I was in my youth out of my body. I'm not in it in my body. I do a lot of walking. I get tired. I get weary. I have aches and pains. I get blisters once in a while. That body I was in, I don't think could have qualified for any of those. But as the last thing I heard was, oh, Lord, we're going over. And then very quickly, I entered into what I call the tunnel. And the reason I call it a tunnel is because if I were to take any of you, put you in a convertible or just a, a car and roll the windows down and blindfold you and go down the highway and say to you, tell me when we enter a tunnel, you could tell me the instant. How? Because the sound of the vehicle would come into the vehicle, wouldn't it? It would go up against the walls of the tunnel and come back. That's the reason I call it a tunnel, because it was the sensation of a tunnel. The sound of my being, the, the second it entered that realm, sounded like I, it reminded me of the sensation of entering a tunnel. However, when I entered that, it was a total change from outside that tunnel. Because inside the tunnel, there was a darkness in there that I say was so dark and so heavy, you could have cut it with a knife. I had never in my life experienced that form of a darkness. In the book of Exodus, the Lord put a darkness, a thick, heavy darkness between the Hebrews camping out there on that peninsula by the Red Sea and the Egyptians. That it says they wandered around and they couldn't even find hardly their hands in front of their face. That's the kind of a darkness it was. I knew I had a body. I knew I was in a sitting position, but I was in a darkness I had never experienced in my life. As I was going backwards, I didn't know at the time I was going backwards, but all of a sudden I heard a voice behind me. And the voice said, turn around, the light is here. You know what I did? I wouldn't turn around. I said, no! I want to go back. My family's hurt. They need me. Then the silence of just that sound like a tunnel again, and I was listening. The reason I think my sense of hearing was so keen was because I was listening with everything within me, trying to hear a whimper, a cry, trying to hear some form of evidence that some of my family had survived that terrible accident. Because in, when I had turned the wheel over to my mother and my wife, we were in big enough mountains that if we would have went off the highway anywhere, it would be all over. If you've ever traveled in the northern mountains of California, you'll know what I mean. They are big mountains, and you can plunge down thousands of feet very quickly. And there's not much left when you get to the bottom. Silence again. I'm concentrating. I'm in a sitting position. My elbows are on my knees, so I assume that I am sitting, leaning forward, concentrating, trying to hear some evidence of life. When again, the voice speaks to me a second time, and it says with a greater urgency, turn around. The light is here. And again, I said, no, I want to go back. My family's hurt. They need me. Now, I had no idea the power of the human will. I had no idea that out of my body I had a choice. This was a revelation to me. The voice did not continue to persist. Only the sound of this tunnel sensation. When after that all of a sudden I burst out of that tunnel like being shot out of a cannon. And as I burst out of it, the earth was right in front of me. It's like I was burst, shot out of it, sitting down, going backwards to where I could see the earth. And you know how they zoom in on the earth from a globe? They zoom in on it. Well, that's the way it was. In my total peripheral vision, I could see nothing but the world. And all of a sudden, the world was just doing this, getting smaller and smaller that fast. Till it went down to about a baseball size in, in my perspective of what I was looking at. And I passed the moon. I looked over at the moon and I said to myself, that's the moon. I've seen many pictures of that. That's what the dark side looks like. 
and I was thoroughly enjoying the moon. But the moon then was getting smaller and smaller, and then I another planet, and another planet went by me. One went by me below, one went by me on the left, and I'm looking at these planets, and I look back at the earth, and the earth all of a sudden is about the size of a marble. That quick, it has become that small. I can see the moon, but I can see these planets, but I can barely discern the earth. The last time I looked back at the earth, all I could see was a little sparkle, looked like a BB, that small. I knew, for some reason in my spirit, I knew it was the earth. It's like I could look at my pattern like you go down a highway and if you look down a long straight road in the periphery of the highway, you remember certain landmarks. I remember the certain orientation of the planets I had been passing. And as I looked at the earth and thought, my goodness, I'm a long ways from home. <laughs> you know. All of a sudden, as I'm looking back that way, I burst into what I call the Milky Way. Now, I, I, I don't have the earth language to explain to you. I don't have the vocabulary. I, I, I can't put it in words what I, what I experienced when I burst into the Milky Way because obviously it was something that I had never seen up close before. Has anybody here seen the Milky Way up close? <laughs> the only way I can explain it to you is, is a feeble attempt, believe me. But it's like when we were kids, we'd sit in the station wagon Dad had in the back seat, and it had a reverse seat in it. You sit in it, and three of us would, uh, brothers would sit back there, and we would cup our hands like this along our face so we couldn't see the terrain alongside in the desert as we went down the pavement. And as we went down the, the blacktop or pavement, we would try to guess at what second we would go off the pavement onto the dust road. Because the second you go on the dust road, you know it because the swirling of the dust comes up and hits the window and all these particles of dust are just hitting the back window and then they begin to accumulate and fall down. You know what I mean? So we'd play the game who can guess the most accurate when we're going to hit the dust? And, of course, the one that guessed just as we hit it always won. So we play games like this. Children always play games like that to, uh, you know, entertain themselves. But the reason I use that, that analogy is because it was a sensation similar to that in the sense that when this, when these all of a sudden the clouds, the, the, the Milky Way didn't swirl like clouds in front of me, but they were so numerous. The planets were so numerous, I could not do like I had been doing before I entered it. Before I entered it, I could distinguish each and every planet I passed and see beautifully the size and the character of them. Now, all of a sudden, there were so many, all I could do was try to focus in on one, but it would be left behind so fast. But I could focus in only long enough to see that it had different characteristics from the previous one I had just looked at. So here I am. I'm looking all around at all of these beautiful, sparkling planets that I am passing so numerous and so fast. And I've completely forgotten about home. I've completely forgotten about my family. My mind isn't on them anymore. I am just totally entertained by all of these beautiful, beautiful heavenly bodies. And... I was thoroughly enjoying that when all of a sudden, back on the ground, they had been doing CPR on me. For you see, when the van came down and stopped on all fours, the 10-year-old boy up front couldn't get his door open, so he crawled out through where the shattered windshield was, where the windshield was. And he crawled out and he came around and he said, I come out around the, the side of the van just in time to see you, Dad, to see you forcing the sliding door open. And he said, you stepped out, your hands were hanging down, and he said, Dad, I looked into your eyes and your face, and you weren't there. 
Now that's a 10-year-old description of death. You weren't there. And he said, you no more than stood on your feet and you fell over backwards and bounced and you didn't move. And he said, there was blood running down your face, but that wasn't even coming out of your head anymore where it had come out. And then these people ran up and they were feeling your neck and your wrists and feeling in front of your face and they started pushing on your chest and blowing in your mouth. Well, they were doing CPR, of course. They didn't do that too long because the more they pumped on my chest and went to blow in my mouth, the more the blood shot out of the hole and the more the blood, when they plugged the hole, it shot out of my nose and my mouth. So they realized that I had been crushed to such a degree that the blood was just going through all ports of my head and the forest ranger who was one of the men doing the CPR said, he told me later, he said, I looked at your children, I looked at you, and he said, if I would have thought there was one ounce of hope, I would have kept doing CPR till I died. I was determined to get you back. But he said, I couldn't believe enough to believe that I could get you back with that fatal of an injury. I looked at the other two that were assisting me and shook my head and said, the injuries are too massive. It won't do any good. So they quit. But when they quit, our 15-year-old daughter that said she had seen my, couldn't see my head as it was rammed down on my shoulders and saw my hands, the level of my shoulders, trembling for a second, then relax. When they looked at each other and gave up and shook their heads, she ran around to the other side of the van where my wife had been taking the, the little ones out of the back and she had been praying over each of them so they wouldn't go into shock. And as we pray, always in a situation of emergency or a possible injury, we always pray for no ill effects. And so she was monitoring them very closely and she assumed that I was taking care of the older ones on the other side and there were no serious emergencies. She heard people talking over there, but uh, she just figured that we were talking about the accident. But then the 15-year-old, when they said it's no use, she screamed running around to Judith, my wife, and she grabbed her and began to pray and rebuke this, this panic and this, this shock that was coming over, this is what she thought. And then Cheryl, our daughter, wrenched herself out of her arms, running back around. And she kind of started to follow her to make sure she was all right, when all of a sudden, before she got around the van, she heard Cheryl saying these words, Devil, that's my daddy. Death, you can't have him. I rebuke you in the name of Jesus. And at that, Judith said, that's my Henry. And she said, I hastened my step and come around and joined in with Cheryl agreeing. Well, then I came back into my body. I came back out of what I call the Milky Way and came back into a body that couldn't feel anything from my temples down. I could feel blood running like, it felt like it was running in my eyes, but I didn't realize it was running behind my eyes. But I couldn't feel it go any farther. I could feel nothing down. I could feel my eyelids blinking. I could hear very well. I heard a person say, he's breathing. I heard another person say, he's got pulse. A man said one and a woman said the other. And then I heard someone running. And I heard a two-way radio. Shall we dispatch an ambulance? And then I heard this man's voice saying, can you hold on that? The woman and the eight children are fine, but we don't know about the man. And I asked him later what that meant and why he said that, and I hope to explain that to you. Well, the essence is he had called out an ambulance two days before, and people were killed on the pass just up above us in the mountains when the ambulance head on into another vehicle that was passing. And there were two people killed in that, and he came on that scene. He called another ambulance out, and that ambulance got into an accident and the attendant was killed. And he said, I wasn't about to do it again. I was not going to risk the life of more people to call them out for a dead man. And uh, so I had this 
problem. I could feel my eyelids blinking, but I couldn't see. I was blind. I could hear very well. But when he said these words, he said, Can you hold on that? The woman and the eight children are fine, but we don't know about the man. It was like a balloon of faith exploded in my being. And I said to myself, there is no reason for me to go to the hospital. I'm going to that wedding. Father, whatever is missing on me, you can put it back together. And I meant it with all of my heart. And then as that ha I prayed that, it was like two cutting torches. One hit me in each temple, and boy, were they hot. And that heat started going down. And as that heat was going down, my vision began to come in. And here was like three, four, five identical twins of this lady right in front of me, leaning over me, pushing on my chest. I didn't know she was. I couldn't feel it yet. But she was leaning over. And she was saying, don't move. You're hurt. We're going to get help. Well, with that, then I heard the man running again, who was the forest ranger, because they'd said he's breathing. He come over. Then he headed back to go get the ambulance there then. And so, with that, the fire went down. And as the fire went down, I began to feel my body and wanted to get up. And I wanted, started to get up, and I could hear the man on the radio trying to say, we need an ambulance quick. And uh, so he just got him on, and I said, I want to get up. And she grabbed me and she says, don't move your head. Your neck could be broken. Your head's been banged up. And she's pushing on my chest and holding my chin. And I said, I'm all right. I'm all right. I want to get up. And she says, please don't move. And I says, I'm okay. I want to get up. So she's one that, like me, can't talk without her hands. She let go of my chin and she says, what are we going to do? He says he's all right. He wants to get up. And with that, she turned her head. So I looked and turned my head in the direction she was looking. And I said, I'm all right. I want to get up. And about that time, the two-way radio said, go ahead. And the man's looking at the microphone in his hand. He's looking at me. And I'm saying, I'm all right. I want to get up. And he says... Oh, 10-4 out. Let him up. I could believe anything at this point. <laughs> Isn't Jesus wonderful? Yeah. How many in the world that believe in Buddha or Muhammad or the Shintos or the Hindi religions, how many have you ever met that talk about a death experience like I've been talking about and have come back to talk about it? I haven't met a one yet. And in my introduction, it was said that I have worked and ministered with over 70 countries of the earth. That's the truth. And I have met many of these people, ministered among thousands of them. And I have yet to have one tell me about the death experience and returning from death. When I was preaching over in Tokyo in the crusade, they had advertised all over Tokyo that I would be there across from the emperor's palace in the big uh, conference center, ministering on the four-day weekend, the biggest holiday weekend in Japan. And uh, God was good to me. He gave me an expert interpreter. Now, in Japan, the number one paid professors or teachers in Japan are those that can teach American English. The highest paid professor in Japan, above all your other realms, is a Japanese professor that is on television every day across Japan, and he teaches American English.